والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Hajj Step by Step. We hope on this program to give you a very detailed look and description of every single aspect of Hajj, inshallah, to make your journey very easy and successful, and inshallah, to make an acceptable Hajj before Allah. I'm Musa Maguire, and our guide for Hajj on this program is Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On the last program we were discussing ihram and the preparations for ihram. We got to the point of when uh, pronouncing the talbiyah or the intention for ihram on the plane or on the ride when, you're, when you reach the appropriate places. Now there's another issue that comes up. Um, some say that there should be two rakats of salah offered uh, before ihram or during ihram. What's exactly the ruling on this practice? Well actually, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Praise be to Allah, we praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show Him guidance. And may peace and blessing be upon our last messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Actually, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam assumed the intention of ihram after he prayed. So the ulama concluded from that, it's recommended to make your intention of ihram and the talbiyah after a prayer, whether it's a fard or a nafli. It's a mandatory prayer or a voluntary one. So if a person happens to be praying dhuhr or a sunnah, any sunnah, then announces the intention of uh, al-ihram afterward, that's fine. But actually there is no specific sunnah before ihram, so you don't have to make a special effort to offer uh, two rak'ahs before ihram. And this is an issue of dispute between the ulama. And you might find in many books that you have to pray two rak'ahs before uh, uh, making the intention of ihram, which you don't have to. Let me ask you, Sheikh, after making ihram and beginning hajj, we know about the, the talbiya of hajj. Should this be started right away, and, and how often should it be recited during the, the, the whole process? Actually, a niyyah, the intention of ihram is always accompanied by a talbiyah. So if a person is performing umrah, would say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِعُمْرَةً Then right away, we'll start making the talbiyah. A talbiyah means answering the call of Allah to perform either hajj or umrah. So when a person says, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ Here I come to you, O Allah, responding to your call. لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ here I come to you, there is no partner to you. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. Indeed, all the praise, the favor, and the dominion belong to you. La sharika lak, no partner to you. It is once again a chantation which announces the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reminds ourselves with his favors upon us. Labbayk Allahumma labbayk. لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنِّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ One who's performing hajj would feel that the entire globe is making talbiyah around him. And this is actually what the Prophet ﷺ said, when a person is making talbiyah, everything to his right hand is making talbiyah as well. Stones, trees, until it, 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 it turns around the entire globe. So all the pilgrims having everything around them, uh, joining them in praising Allah the Almighty and thanking Him. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ in one hadith said that the best hajj is al-ajj thaj which refers to raising the voice with at talbiyah so that a person, a male pilgrim, 
would say at talbiya out loud so that everything around him would hear. He doesn't have to scream out loud in a way that he would demonstrate his response to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opposite will be with a woman that she would say it in a way that she would only hear herself. A woman should not raise her voice as much as a man should not be heard by other men. Shaykh, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, let's go back to some of the issues dealing with ihram itself, uh, as this is such an important and foundational element to hajj. What about the restrictions? What, once we enter the state of ihram, we've made the tawbiyya, what are the restrictions now? Uh, when a person says, now, ana muhrim, I'm in a state of ihram. Once he assumes intention on the plane, from the appointed places of ihram, he enters and commences on a state of sacredness. There are certain acts which we used to do before that. It was permissible. But now in a state of ihram, they have become restricted. And no one should violate if he or she is a muhrim. Number one is al-jima' and its introductions, which is approaching uh, one's spouse uh, sexually uh, or anything that leads to it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated, Al-Hajju ashhurum ma'lumat, faman tharada fihin al-Hajj, fala rafatha, wala fusuqa, wala jidala fil Hajj. Whoever assumes the intention of making Hajj and commence on Ihram should avoid a rafath, which refers to sexual activities, sexual intercourse, al-jima'ah. Al-Fusuq, sins, and uh, uh, any evil talk and any unnecessary vain conversation ولا جدال nor an argument in the state of ihram so a person should not approach his wife while he is in the state of ihram same thing with the wife what if that happens uh, it depends if they fall into a complete sexual intercourse they have actually violated a great restriction and void their entire hajj. So the hajj of that person in the state of ihram is void completely. However, he or she, both of course the spouses, have to go on and complete all the rites of the hajj during that season and this year, even though their hajj is void. And the penalty is very great that they have to offer a sacrifice, which is a badana. This is a camel at least five years old and older. The scholar said that uh, if the wife agreed with the husband in this practice, she too have to offer a sacrifice, a penalty of a badana, a camel five years old or older. And this hajj, whether it is mandatory or was voluntary, they still owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another hajj to be done next year or whenever they can do it. Even if it was a voluntary hajj, you see that the penalty is very, very severe. Because when one is in a state of ihram, you should keep in mind that this is a sacred condition. Shaykh, this is a, obviously a very severe uh, penalty for a very severe, a severe offense. But um, we've talked about some of the other issues that are requirements. For instance, the, the, the appointed places and times of entering ihram. Uh, if someone doesn't do it at the appointed time, is it the same level of penalty that they're going to face if they uh, don't put on the, the, uh, the, the garments appropriately or don't make the intention? No, actually, these are two different cases. The, the, the case you just mentioned is related to things to be done mandatorily before ihram and during the pronunciation of the ihram intention. That we agreed that the Prophet ﷺ appointed certain places that if you're passing through them or in line with them, there and only there, you get to say لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ بِعُمْرَ or لَبَّيْكَ بِحَجْ If a person happens, as many people assume that Jeddah airport is a place of assuming the intention of ihram, they have violated the wajib. A part of the pillar of hajj, which is ihram, a wajib, is to pronounce the intention or talbiya at the appointed place. So if they did not do so and they waited until they passed Al-Miqat, in this case, they have to do one, one of two things. Either go back to Al-Miqat and make the intention from there and make the talbiyah from there 
and of course to many people especially who came via air it's almost impossible so the only way is a penalty which is to slaughter a sheep in Mecca to be distributed amongst the poor there is a very important notice here I would like to mention which is the difference between the penalty and the sacrifice Al Hajj is a sacrifice which a pilgrim would offer by the end of the conclusion of their Hajj uh, this Hajj is similar to Al Uthiyah that you may eat of it give gifts to your friends and relatives and distribute upon the poor as well but in case of the penalty it has to be slaughtered in Mecca and it has to be distributed amongst the poor people of Mecca and you're not allowed to best to taste a bite of it because that's a penalty and this is a ransom you're, you're giving or paying for a violation that you've committed uh, if a person happens to be visiting the city of the Prophet Wasallam before the performance of Hajj before the actual Hajj going to Mecca and so on in this case they may keep their clothes on and of course they go to al Medina with their regular uh, condition everyday clothes and there while coming back from al Medina, they will be treated as the people who do well in al Medina. so they will assume the intention of Al-Ihram from the appointed place of al Medina people which is Dhul Hulayfa or it is known nowadays as Abiyar Ali. Sheikh, I want to get back to this issue of jima'ah or the, the sexual relations between the spouses during the time of Ihram because it carries such a serious penalty. What about when someone is combining the Hajj or separating the Umrah and the Hajj uh, and exits Ihram? Is, is this permissible at that time? You see, that's why Allah gave us uh, uh, an ease while performing Hajj and Umrah. And that's why it's recommended to choose Hajj al tamattu where you perform the Umrah, and once you're done with your Umrah uh, rites, you shave or you trim your hair, then you're free. A person may embrace his wife and have all the marital relationship they want to have, as long as they're in a state of tahallul, they exited already from Ihram. And that will continue until the eighth day of Dhul Hajjah, where they would assume a new intention for the performance of Hajj. Sheikh, uh, there are plenty of issues left to deal with concerning Ihram, but we need to take a short break. So please stay with us, and we'll be back in just a minute, insha'Allah. As-salamu alaykum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Hajj Step by Step. Before the break, we were talking about some of the restrictions of Ihram. Now, concerning the major uh, acts of, of marital relations that can really invalidate the whole Hajj, does the same apply to just you know small intimacies between the spouses? Well, the word rafath uh, refers to the sexual uh, contact and its introductions. But the penalty differs by the meaning if there was a complete uh, sexual intercourse, uh, all what we mentioned applies here. So that the Hajj is void, they have to perform another Hajj, the penalty applies, uh, and they have to ask for forgiveness, etc. But in case that there was just some, you know, touching, hugging, kissing, etc., without having an actual intercourse, it's a sin, it's a big sin. But they may go on in their Hajj, their Hajj will be valid, but they have to offer a penalty, which is slaughtering a sheep, will be treated as any penalty we discussed before, to be slaughtered in Mecca and to be distributed amongst the poor of Mecca, and they cannot taste it. Well, what if somebody is saving the occasion of Hajj to perform another very happy occasion, which is marriage? Of course, when people get married, they want to have relations right away. Is, this, uh, is, is there any exception for this, or is there any specific rule about marriage during the time of Hajj? Actually, no wonder that uh, whenever we were taught that during Ihram, that a person may not get engaged or engage others, or get involved uh, in any marriage contract by any means, one would wonder, uh, who would think or care about that? But actually, a lot of people save this happy occasion to be done during the performance of Hajj or Umrah. Yet... If a person is in a state of ihram, he may not engage, get engaged, or seek or be sought for. 
should not be involved in any activities of engagement, marriage, or marriage contract at all. And if this happened, the scholars say that this marriage contract which took place during the state of Ahram is invalid. The Prophet ﷺ stated that لا ينكح المحرم ولا يخطب ولا ينكح A person who is in a state of Ahram should not get married even having the marriage contract or the engagement or being sought for. Well, Shaykh, we now have a short video that we're going to show showing some of the other prohibitions during the state of Ihram. So if perhaps you could just explain some of them, and then when we're done, we'll go into a little more detail. Well, as we see that uh, uh, of the restrictions, cutting, shaving, or removing any hair of the body of the muhrim that's apply, that applies for a man or a woman, clipping the nails, these are all restricted acts, wearing fragrance by any means, whether applied to the body or to the ihram clothes, and that applies to both, hunting or targeting or scaring an animal during the state of ihram, breaking a tree or removing a branch, and uh, the last two issues, hunting and breaking the trees in Mecca, and the third one, which is picking up lost items, are prohibited during all times. That's not only limited during the state of Ihram, but once you are in the boundaries of Mecca, the sacred city, you cannot scare, you cannot hunt an animal, uh, you're not allowed to break a tree or cut grass, or you're not allowed to pick up any lost items, except if you're picking them up for clarification and to announce to the public that somebody lost their property. So if you're taking them to turn them to the authorities, that's valid, but you're not allowed to take the lost items and even give it in a charity. As we see that it's prohibited during ihram for the muhrim to cover his head. Uh, of course, that's for a man. Uh, covering the head by wearing a kufi, a cap, uh, or by the ihram clothes is prohibited. While uh, holding an umbrella or staying in a tent is permissible during the state of Ihram. As we see in this picture that if you are in the state of Ihram, you're not allowed to wear any stitched clothes. All your clothes have to be seamless. Uh, of course, that is the Ihram clothes, the Izar and Al-Ihram. As we see in the picture that somebody is wearing the shoes which are covering his ankles, that's too restricted during the state of Ihram. Rather, the muhrim would wear a pair of sandals that applies only to men. But as we discussed before, for women, they may wear whatever they wish of their uh, daily regular clothes. Well, what are some of the penalties for these acts if they do by any chance happen? For instance, if someone decides to, to go hunting or commits any other of these acts, do they have the same penalties or do the penalties vary? Well, not necessarily somebody would go hunting if somebody hit an animal, a deer by his car, etc. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran uh, stated very clearly, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqtulu al-sayda wa antum hurum. Surah Al-Ma'idah. O you who believe, do not hunt or kill an animal while you are in the state of ihram. وَمَنْ قَتَلَهُ مِنْكُمْ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاءٌ مِثْلُ مَا قَتَلَ مِنَ النَّعَمْ يَحْكُمُ بِهِ ذَوَا عَدْلٍ مِنْكُمْ هَدِيًا بَالِغَ الْكَعْبَةِ And whoever does so hunt during the state of Ihram, then would assign two just judges from amongst ourselves who would evaluate the value of that animal which has been hit or hunted, and they would judge with a similar animal of domestic animals of equivalent value. That animal will be slaughtered and distributed in Mecca amongst the poor. Uh, in case that a person has to wear regular clothes or has to shave or clip the nails, as for instance, who are having a very strong reference, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ by the name Ka'b ibn Ujra, may Allah be pleased with him. Uh, this companion uh, would, was uh, uh, infected with lice in his hair. The Quran says, وَلَا تَحْلِقُوا رُؤُوسَكُمْ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ الْهَدْيُ مَحِلَّةِ and you should not shave your heads until the sacrifice or the offering has been sacrificed. And that's after the day of Arafah, on the Eid day. But before, while you are still in a state of Ihram, you're not allowed to shave any hair from your body, whether it's your head hair, mustache, beard, or any hair on your body. And that applies for both men and women. 
So when he appeared before the Prophet ﷺ so in this condition and actually lice was walking on his forehead, the Prophet ﷺ uh, made a remark and he said that, I didn't know that it was hurting you that much. Uh, do you have a sheep? He said, no. He said, go ahead and shave. Okay. And uh, fast for three days, feed six masakeen or fast for three days. So the ulama concluded from that, and there is a Quranic reference to that, that uh, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ بِهِ أَدَمْ مَنْ رَأْسِهِ فَفِدْيَةٌ مِنْ صِيَامٍ أَوْ صَدَقَةٍ أَوْ نسك. So the person in the state of ihram, uh, upon having to shave for any reason, would be given the choice to offer which penalty he can afford. If he can afford to pay uh, uh, to buy a sheep and slaughter, that's fine. If he would like, he can just feed six masakeen of al-haram by giving each one of them have sa and a size equal to one and a half kilogram of dates, raisin, or any average food that the people uh, consume in the area. Uh, or fast for three days if a person has to clip nails or shave the hair. What if a person does any of those violations of shaving, removing hair, clipping nails, or wearing a kufi, or wearing the regular clothes, stitched clothes, uh, unknowingly, or out of forgetfulness. In this case, he only owes asking for forgiveness and immediately had to change that mistake by taking off the cap if he's wearing a cap, or taking off his regular clothes and putting on the ihram clothes back. Changing the mistake, and asking for forgiveness without any penalty, simply because that person did that while forgetting or unknown. You know, Hajj these days is in the winter months, uh, and I don't personally know how cold it gets in Mecca during the winter months, but say it becomes very cold. Um, does the, the situation of wearing extra clothing, uh, is, it, is it like the situation of being sick and having a necessity? Is the, is the same rule apply? You see, if a person wears a blanket, it's not considered as regular clothes because it was not made to fit. So a person may cast a blanket on top of his shoulders. But if he wears regular clothes, in this case, uh, 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 the penalty of shaving will be applicable there as well. Okay. And Sheikh, we talked about a lot of the prohibitions, but sometimes people maybe take it a little bit too far. They start imagining that everything is prohibited. What are some of the things that are permissible to, in a state of ihram, uh, especially those things that people may be confused about? I'm very glad you raised this question and this issue because unfortunately sometimes we see uh, pilgrims performing tawaf in dirty ihram clothes. Then you wonder, uh, ihram clothes are very cheap. So why are you wearing dirty clothes? Some people are under the impression that once you commence on a state of ihram, you're not allowed to change your ihram clothes. Nor are you allowed to take a shower or a bath. You're not allowed even to wash your clothes. This is totally wrong and this is a great misunderstanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he likes beauty. If a person is in a state of ihram, he may take a shower, take a bath whenever it's needed to clean up themselves. Just avoid using and applying any fragrance to the body or to their clothes. Can a person change their ihram clothes? Perfectly fine. They may change their ihram clothes uh, as they wish, and it's not restricted at all. Uh, people ask about wearing uh, a belt around their waist, which has a wallet to preserve and protect their valuables and so on. It is permissible and it is allowed. However, I do not advise any person to carry their valuables in the belt because it's like inviting, saying that I have valuables here. Rather, always upon performing the mashair and the manasik, especially the tawaf, you don't need to take any valuables with you. Leave all your valuables at your hotel room or with somebody so that you can have clear mind while performing those acts of worship. Uh, we've talked about it is prohibited to wear anything that covers the head for men. You see, some people, they panic and they're very excessive in that regard. So that uh, you see people do not ride in buses which have roofs because they assume that that's a roof and it, it's like a, wearing a cap or a, or a hat and it's one of the restrictions of haram. This is wrong. 
we're talking about an object which would make a direct contact with your head, such as your ihram, a blanket, or a kufi, or a cap. But the umbrella, your tent, your room, the bus, is all fine. No problem with that. Sheikh, let me ask one more thing. We're almost out of time. We know that it's a very sacred state to be in ihram. Uh, what about committing sins during this time? Are sins considered worse during this time if people are backbiting or speaking coarsely or doing any of the other things that we would consider sins outside of ihram? No one who's going for hajj can afford uh, missing up their hajj but just by just talking about others, backbiting, vain talk, making lies. Why? You will spend a lot of money and you're making a lot of effort for one reason hoping that Allah would accept this act of worship from you and will forgive you all your past sins. Uh, it's a sacred place and sacred time. Good deeds are being doubled and multiplied in so many folds. Similarly, sins will be doubled and multiplied because of the sacredness of the place and the time. Thank you, Sheikh. I think we have a very strong understanding of Ihram. Uh, we still have a lot more to cover with, with Hajj in general, and we'll do that and continue to do that in our next episode. Please stay tuned for that. We hope to see you then. I'm Musa McGuire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Thank you.